My name is Dan O'Malley, and I'm here to talk about some work we've done focused on homomorphic encryption for quantum annealing using spin reversal transformations. So before I get into the concept of homomorphic encryption, I just briefly wanted to discuss the concept of encryption in general. So suppose that Alice wants to send a message to, to someone else named Bob, um, and so a third party, for example, called Oscar, can deliver the message, but Alice doesn't really trust Oscar uh, to know the contents of the message. She, she wants him to deliver it, but she doesn't want him to know what the message says. So encryption is a tool that allows Alice to have Oscar deliver the message without having to trust Oscar to know what the message says. Uh, and the idea is actually a little bit more general than this. Um, that's sort of the common use of encryption that we you know, we use to communicate with our banks and things like that. But the idea is a little bit more general. It's really about encoding information so that some people can understand it and others cannot understand it. So homomorphic encryption is another form of encryption. It's not really about sending messages, but it's more about performing computations. So in this scenario, suppose that Alice wants to perform a computation, but she doesn't have a computer that can, that can perform the computation. On the other hand, you know, Oscar does have a computer, but similar to before, Alice doesn't trust Oscar to know what he computed. So homomorphic encryption is what allows Alice to have Oscar perform the computation without knowing what he computed. So it's kind of remarkable that this is actually possible, but, but it is possible. Um, and so homomorphic encryption would allow someone who doesn't have a computer to tell someone who does have a computer to perform a computation and the person who does the computation would never know what they were computing. So just to give a little bit of background on homomorphic encryption, since I'm guessing a lot of people may not be familiar with it, uh, the concept of so-called fully homomorphic encryption was first proposed in 1978. And this is in contrast with so-called partially homomorphic encryption schemes, which only allow you to do you know, a certain subset of computations. For example, they might allow you to multiply but not to add, um, whereas fully homomorphic uh, encryption allows you to sort of do arbitrary computations. And, you know, af after the fully homomorphic uh, encryption idea was proposed in 1978, people spent three decades sort of coming up with these partially homomorphic schemes, but without really discovering a fully homomorphic scheme. Uh, and then the big development came in 2009 when Craig Gentry, uh, in his PhD thesis, described a fully homomorphic encryption scheme. Um, one of the big downsides of this approach is that it was extremely slow. Uh, if you Google around and, and try to get an idea of how slow it was, uh, I think the number you see a lot is 100 trillion times slower. Uh, that's the slowdown sort of associated with it. And then sort of since 2009, a lot of work has been done to, to speed up homomorphic encryption and a lot of progress has been made. Um, you know, factors of 10 million or 100 million or something like that. Um, and the, sort of the most impressive uh, result that I was able to find was that Microsoft has a paper out where they can classify on the order of 10, I think around 50 MNIST digits per second using a simple uh, neural network that's sort of constructed in a way that makes it friendly to the fully homomorphic encryption. And just so for people who don't know, MNIST is just this standard data set that people use in machine learning of, of images. And, it, and the, per, the task is basically to say, is this a zero, a one, a two, three, four, up through nine. Um, and so that's kind of maybe the state of the art for where classical fully homomorphic encryption is. You may be thinking that the sort of setup that I had for homomorphic encryption was a little ridiculous that, you know, Alice needs to perform a computation, but she doesn't have a computer and she says she needs to use Oscar's computer because, you know, computers are so ubiquitous that now everybody has a computer. So is homomorphic encryption still important? You know, I think the answer is probably yes. Uh, and a good example is like, if you could imagine, you know, we have third parties do our computations all the time, for example, a very common one is search. You know, we search for web pages on the internet all the time. You know, Google collects all this information about us based on our search history. And it would be kind of nice if we had a search engine, for example, that didn't know what you were searching for. So for scenarios like that, it could still be useful. Um, but it's also even more important, I think, for quantum computing, because when it comes to quantum computers, almost nobody has a quantum computer. Um, you know, there's only a few organizations in the world that, you know, have their own quantum hardware. 
Uh, and unless you belong to one of these organizations, you're going to have to trust a third party to do the computation for you. Um, and in some cases, you may be legally prevented from sharing the information. So for example, if you have HIPAA data, which is you know, sensitive health-related data, um, you know, there's a lot of laws about how that data can be shared. Um, and you know, if you're in a situation where you needed to use a quantum computer to process that data, and uh, you weren't allowed to share it with this third party, then you just might not be able to do the computations that you need to do. As you're probably aware, there's basically two types of quantum computing hardware that are currently being developed at some level. So one of these types of hardware is gate-based quantum computing, and that's being pursued you know, very intensely by companies like IBM and Google. And here at Cubix, Qubits, the focus is more on quantum annealing because that's the hardware that D-Wave makes. Um, and the homomorphic encryption scheme that I'm going to talk about uh, doesn't directly apply to this gate-based quantum computing. It really is focused on quantum annealing. And I just want to briefly review the basic setup for the quantum annealing that's implemented in D-Wave's hardware uh, because it's, it's important for the technique you're going to use to do the, to do the homomorphic encryption. So the basic setup is that a user has a problem Hamiltonian, um, which is uh, given in the top equation there, and it has these coefficients h, h sub i and j sub i j, and these are sort of like the inputs that the user gives to the, to the machine. Uh, and then there's a hardware Hamiltonian, which uh, transitions between uh, this Hamiltonian given by the sigma x's and the, and the problem Hamiltonian. Uh, and you can sort of think of this as minimizing a mathematical function. Uh, f of s equals the sum of h i times s i plus the sum of j i j times s i times s j, where the s i and s j's can either take plus or minus one. So now we can get to the, the fundamental concept that we use to do the homomorphic encryption, which is spin reversal transformations. And sometimes these are also called gauge transformations. And the basic idea is to take this original problem that's given by the problem Hamiltonian and this mathematical function f of s and transform it into a new but equivalent problem. Uh, and the way that you do this is you generate a binary string x and in terms of the homomorphic encryption this binary string is going to be used uh, as a secret key that never gets shared with anybody. So I would generate this on my computer and, ne and never, you know, ne never communicate the x to anybody. Um, and then I use that to transform the problem using this spin reversal transformation, which basically just amounts to uh, replacing some variables SI with minus SI um, and leaving some of the variables untransformed. Um, and then you send this transformed problem to the, to the D-Wave hardware, have it solve that, and then it sends you back these transformed samples, which you can then use this X, this binary string X, to sort of transform back to uh, the variables s that you were interested in, so the untransformed variables s. Um, and this is sort of the key, the key mechanism that makes this homomorphic encryption scheme possible. Now I'll tell you how you can use this uh, spin reversal transformation process to get, to get homomorphic encryption. So how does the homomorphic encryption work? So the first step is that, you know, me as a user, I would be sitting at my own classical computer and I would generate uh, an icing problem. So like, for example, I would generate the the H's and the J's that we saw on the, on the last couple slides. And then I would also just generate a random binary string um, and, and use that to define my spin reversal transformation. So this random binary uh, string uh, is basically the secret key that never gets shared with anybody. Uh, so after I've transformed the icing problem uh, into this encoded icing problem, I then send it to the quantum annealer where the quantum annealer now has this transformed icing problem, uh, which it solves um, and produces these uh, transformed samples. So you can think of the samples that it produces as being encoded with this secret key X. Uh, then I download the samples from the quantum annealer and apply the spin transformation again to get the decoded solution uh, and get the untransformed samples. And that's basically how so I mentioned earlier that uh, using fully homomorphic encryption, using classical schemes for fully homomorphic encryption incurs a very significant performance cost. Um, and you may also recall that the most impressive example I could find was Microsoft, which was classifying something like 50 
m missed digits per second using a using a simple neural network. So a natural question to ask is how do these spin reversal transformations impact performance in quantum annealing? And so the short answer is it has no impact on performance, um, and that sort of would be expected theoretically. We also uh, compared the performance of of uh, using spin reversal transformations and not using spin reversal transformations on Lannell's D-Wave using three different classes of problems that sort of have different structures. Um, and you know this this sort of short answer was was demonstrated also by these example problems. And I'll take you through these problems. The first problem that we'll look at is a matrix factorization problem. Uh, and so this the goal of this matrix factorization algorithm is to prop to factor a big matrix into the product of a tall skinny matrix and a short wide matrix. And we applied this on a on a matrix that has uh, 2,500 about 2,500 facial images in it. So each column in the matrix is uh, one facial image. And um, so one of the one of the factors in this problem is that it uses the embedding of a complete graph. So the the icing problem uh, requires a complete graph. Um, and in this case, we found that when we applied a uh, one of these random spin reversal transformations that are part, are part of our homomorphic encryption scheme, um, it gave slightly better performance than the unencrypted approach. But in, you know, we really don't think this is significant. It's just sort of the noise and the luck of getting a good spin reversal transformation. Um, and if you're interested in more details on this problem, uh, there's there's the reference that you can. The next problem we'll look at is a problem in hydrologic inverse analysis. Uh, so the goal here in hydrology terms is to identify the permeability in an aquifer. So you can think about if you had water flowing underground, you're trying to sort of say in which parts of the subsurface can, can water easily flow through and in which parts does it have a hard time flowing through. Um, and this is a little bit different than the last problem. Instead of using the embedding of a complete graph, this uses a structured embedding with about four qubits per, per variable, so four qubits per permeability. And in this case, the homomorphic encryption approach very, very slightly outperformed the unencrypted approach. But again, we think this is more just luck and noise and getting a good spin reversal transformation. And in this case, actually, the performance difference was extremely small. So you can see the plot on the right, um, the green one, or the blue, the blue curve sh shows the distribution of energies you get if you don't use a spin reversal transformation, and then the the light green lines show the, uh, the the distribution of energies you get if you'd apply ten different random spin reversal transformations. And you can see that sort of the green curves just envelop the blue curve uh, really nicely, and the performance is about the same for these two. The last problem we'll look at is the RAN one benchmark. Um, which is very commonly used uh, in benchmarking D-Wave systems. And the goal is basically to minimize the energy in an artificial problem that's very well suited to the hardware. So part of the reason why this is well suited to the hardware is that it doesn't use an embedding. Uh, this problem is sort of native to the Chimera graph or really any graph you want it to be native to. And in this case, the homomorphic encryption approach was slightly outperformed by the unencrypted, the unencrypted approach. But again, this was just luck noise. And actually, in this in this RAN one case, you can come up with good arguments for why uh, there should be no performance difference in this case, because really, uh, applying the spin reversal transformation just transforms one random RAN one realization into a different RAN one realization, and you could, you sort of could have had them flipped around, uh, and that would be equally likely. And again, for more details on on the RAN one problem, um, there's there's a reference for you to take a look at. The lack of performance impact uh, of this homomorphic encryption approach really shouldn't be surprising. You know, for a perfect piece of hardware, there should be no impact. And for imperfect hardware that has noise associated with the coefficients that you're sending in, uh, these spin reversal transformations are often used to improve performance. So for example, uh, there's a link to one of D-Wave's doc, you know, D -Wave's documentation that talks about using these spin reversal transformations to improve performance. And there's also some other papers out there that show different techniques for using the spin reversal transformations to improve performance. Um, and so generally these require applying multiple spin reversal transformations to get the performance improvements or sort of finding a good spin reversal transformation. Um, and you know these techniques for uh, improving performance with spin reversal transformations can be applied on top of our approach to homomorphic encryption. Um, so 
you can still get the benefits of these approaches. And, you know, they also sort of justify this idea that there shouldn't, we shouldn't expect there to be any performance loss from doing a swing reversal transform. So in scenarios where you have a problem that you need to solve, and it requires homomorphic encryption, for example, if you have some sensitive data that you can't share with the third party, uh, the quantum annealing approach for homomorphic encryption that we have here contrasts nicely with the existing approaches for homomorphic and fully homomorphic encryption with classical computers. So um, if you sort of think about some hypothetical problem where you have to solve it with and without homomorphic encryption, uh, if you did that with a classical computer using existing homomorphic, fully homomorphic encryption approaches, uh, the performance of the classical computer is really going to degrade if you require homomorphic encryption. Uh, on the other hand, as we've shown here, and as is sort of theoretically expected, for quantum annealing using this homomorphic encryption approach, there's no performance penalty. So potentially if you had a, a quantum annealing problem, a problem that could be solved with quantum annealing that was sort of within striking distance of the performance of classical, and you needed to use homomorphic encryption, um, and you use this sort of classical fully homomorphic encryption approaches, this could be something that uh, gives quantum annealing a performance advantage uh, in the cases where the homomorphic encryption is needed. And I just wanted to wrap up with a few notes and a discussion of some future work that could be done related to this work. So one thing to keep in mind is that I, my discussion was focused about on, um, you know, the forward mode quantum annealing, but this, this encryption technique can be trivially extended to, to apply to reverse annealing. And in this case, you would just, in addition to applying the spin reversal transformation to the problem Hamiltonian that you send to the quantum annealer, you would also uh, apply the spin reversal transformation to the classical state uh, before sending it to the quantum annealer. So um, this can be easily extended to include the reverse annealing uh, mode of operation for D-Ways machines. Another thing to keep in mind is that uh, in some cases where you have some sensitive information, for example, if two parties had medical information about a patient that they can't share with each other, but a computation needs to be done that requires both parties' data. So for example, one institution has part of their medical records and another institution has another part, um, and they need to make a diagnosis that really requires all of this information. You can sort of have each of the two parties construct a Cubo or, or an icing model based on the data that they do have, and then those icing models can be added together to produce an icing model that would uh, incorporate all the data. And you can, you can apply this uh, in, with this homomorphic, you can, you can solve problems like that with this homomorphic encryption schemes if, if you're sort of willing to trust that third party not to share their individual, icing, or, or sorry, not to share the individual icing models uh, between the people who have the problems. And, and if those two people who have the individual problems sort of have, share a secret key. So for example, if, if Alice and I both shared a secret key and we had part of, the, part of the problem that we wanted to solve, we would each encrypt our problem with that secret key, uh, send it to D, send the problem, send each of those two problems to D-Wave. D-Wave could then sum those two problems um, and, and solve that and send the results back to both of us. And we would just sort of have to trust D-Wave not to, uh, for example, send Alice's uh, icing model to me or send my icing model to Alice. Um, and then we, we could work in that mode as well. Uh, it's also worth pointing out that, you know, again, the, the discussion here is focused on quantum annealing, but this approach to homomorphic encryption can also be applied to optical annealers, uh, you know, so-called digital annealers, and just generally classical software that solves icing problems. Um, so there's definitely some future work needed related to this. Um, you know, the encryption sort of seems secure on the surface, but we haven't really provided any rigorous guarantees, and I think that's something that should be looked into more. It sort of seems like RAN1 could be a good class of problems where you could provide some nice rigorous uh, security guarantees. And, uh, you know, someone should implement this in open source software. It's very easy to implement, um, and we would do it ourselves, but it's kind of arduous to get open source software released here, and I think it might be easier if somebody else, if somebody else did it. And I think a last important question is, how is the performance on other hardware and software impacted by the spin reversal transformations? So for example, if you were to use a, you know, optical annealer or um, classical software that solves icing models, how would that impact performance? Um, and would there, would there be no performance loss like there is in, with, with the quantum annealer or would there be more of a performance loss?
think that's still a question that you know we have we haven't answered. And thanks for thanks for listening, and I hope you enjoyed the talk.